Well, we do want to thank you, Lord, for just being the awesome God that you are. We continue to give you praise. We give you the glory, and we give you the honor. Father, we do want to pray for Commissioner Rogers' family. His dad passed away, Lord. We just pray and ask that you be with him, Lord. Comfort him, Lord God. Father God, we just ask that you show them your love, Lord God, as they go through this time of loss. Father, we pray for the deputies' families in Trenton, Florida. We lost two fine young men, Lord God, and we just pray and ask that you be with their families also, Lord. Father, continue to be with the United States of America. Father, I think we have gotten away from the love, Lord. We, we need to start loving one another, Father. Father, continue to lead the United States of America. We pray for each and every leader of this country, Lord. We pray for our local leaders. Continue to give us wisdom and understanding, Father, as we do the best to lead our people, Lord. We pray for our military. Keep them, Father, from any hurt, harm, and danger. We lift up our first responders, our law enforcement officers, Lord. We pray your hedge protection, your angels continue to be encamped around them. Bless the people of Gulf County. Bless this board, Lord, as we conduct the business of the people of Gulf County. We thank you. We give you praise. We give you glory. And we give you honor. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Join me in the pledge, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Once again, good morning and welcome everyone to the uh, Board of County Commissioners April 24th meeting. Uh, just a quick reminder at the end of the meeting, if, if anyone has any uh, business before the board, uh, make sure you please fill out the public speaking form that's located behind Mr. Joe Paul and Mr. Houston. Um, make sure you get that filled out for us. Also, when, uh, just a quick reminder, when you come up to the podium, please make sure you state your name, your address. Uh, for the record, and also make sure you please speak uh, speak into the microphone. If not, Ms. Roberts will give me a funny look. So please make sure you speak directly into the microphone. At this time, uh, we're going to address the uh, consent agenda. This is where uh, one vote covers uh, multiple uh, multiple items um, that's in the consent agenda. Uh, at this time, I ask, is there anyone in the audience who have any questions or concerns with the consent agenda? Anyone in the audience? Questions or concerns with the uh, consent agenda? Okay. Is there anyone on the staff that have any questions or concerns with the consent, consent agenda? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, on 63 through 67 on the consent, uh, you have a temporary construction access easement that is for Salinas Park. They're going to do some construction and that type thing on Salinas Park. I was called uh, yesterday afternoon to say that there may be some minor changes to that. What I would like for the board to do, if you would, is to approve that. And if there are minor changes to that, to, to allow the attorney and staff to review those minor changes. If there's anything major, we'll come back to the board. But if there's minor changes, if, if you all would allow us to, to do that, that would be great. OK. You need a motion, Warren? I think you can cover it with Okay. Once we, once we, okay, okay. Anybody else on staff? Mr. Paul? Morning, Mr. Chairman, Good Commissioners. The, uh, the new local housing assistance plan that was in your consent for 2018, 19, 19, 20, and 2021, uh, that's the yellow sticky note you have in front of you. Uh, the pages, the changes are on the pages that I listed on the yellow sticky. And, uh, Inadvertently, the resolution, which is Exhibit E, which is the last page in there, was actually left out of the consent. Uh, I need to have a motion to approve the resolution, which approves the LHAP. All right, so I entertain them. So move. Hold up, hold up. We still, uh, once we approve the agenda, we should that's still be good. Unless we need to add something, right? You'll just include that pages 6, 7, 8, and 10. It will include that resolution. Okay. In our attempt to, because that was such a big document, we, we just put the cover sheet in and, and we missed the resolution. So if you can just add pages 6, 7, 8, and 10 uh, into your consent agenda when you approve it, it'll be good. Okay. Uh, 6, 7, 8, and 10, excuse me. 
boss. Uh, six, sorry. seven, eight, and ten are the changes, the changes. to the LHAP. I just highlighted them so you okay. know. The Actually, is. Exhibit E, if you'll add Exhibit E, which is a two-page document, to the consent, then once you approve it, the resolution will approve the LHAP. Okay. All right. Thank so, you, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right. Any other staff members before we uh, um, hold on one second, Mr. Okay. Mr. Floyd? Uh, we're still addressing the consent. Um, any other staff members with any issues with the consent agenda? All right, Mr. Floyd, what you come to speak on? Uh, yes, I'm sorry, I may have missed that. I'm not, I'm not uh, sure what's on the consent agenda, but uh, there's a, um, a variance that uh, we had come to a resolution on with Dr. Rehack and uh, Jerry Novak and and. Uh, Jack Husband and I had worked on it, and okay. I'm not sure where it is, but I, I didn't want to pass by yeah. it. Yeah, I don't think so. I'd say, Mr. Ford, not in the consent. Yeah. I think so. Well, it's number six, so we'll, we're going to get okay. to that yeah. one. Yeah. We got you. Thanks we got you covered. It. Yes, sir. Are any uh, other staff members with anything, uh, any problems with the consent? Any board members? Any board members? Any questions with the consent agenda? All right, Mr. Uh, Mr. McCrone, so in your motion, you're going to include... Mr. Joe Paul, you're going to include the uh, pages 6, 7, 8, and 10, and Exhibit E, right. your motion. Uh, so I got a, a motion to accept the uh, consent agenda with adding uh, pages 6, 7, 8, 10, and Exhibit E. Do I have a second? Second. Got a motion by Commissioner McCrone, second by uh, Commissioner McDaniel. Um, anyone in the public on this? Any board members? In opposition to the motion, motion passes 5 and 0 to accept the consent. All right, we'll move right on down to county staff business. Sam, are you up first? Chairman, I provided y'all a handout and I gave the clerk one on, on the front is the uh, change order with. Uh, the road additions that Mr. Smallwood got to us yesterday afternoon includes Avenue A, uh, Coquina Drive, Guff Air Drive, and I think there's two other patches on here. Total of the amount of the change order is $302,742.59. Need a motion to approve change order full. Nice. Can I get a motion? So to move. All right, got a motion by Commissioner Rogers. Second that, sir. Second by Commissioner Rich. Any further board discussion? What, uh, Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Go ahead. All right. Mr. Administrator, what roads was that again? I didn't see. Uh, <coughs> this this uh, uses the balance of District 4's road funds okay. on Avenue A. Uh, District 4, all right. It's also District 3. Uh, there are two patches in Guff Air, uh, a road in Seashores Resurface, Coquina Drive, and a road in Guff Air, Guff Air Drive. And I believe it goes to trade winds. Buccaneer. Buccaneer, I'm sorry. From right. the from the from the first entrance around to Buccaneer. That's good. Was that originally on the schedule, Michael? Was that just on the uh, road paving? It, it's it, district road paving funds out of, out of the road bond. Okay. Okay. Any any further board discussion? <laughs> Anyone in the public on this? Anyone in the public? Any opposition to the motion? My motion passes five and zero. The had a meeting with the clerk yesterday. They're going to send a letter today to the city for their balance, and I don't want to quote that, but it's it's just under a million dollars, I think, was what the final total was. And and Madam Clerk is going to send that to the city. Uh, that they, they have agreed to to encumber that money before the deadline on June thirtieth. That's good. The next thing I have is uh, follow up. We signed a contract last Thursday. Um, with Richard Hines on the Sheriff's Office 911 uh, building. Uh, we need y'all to approve that uh, lease that, that I signed last Thursday. Y'all gave me permission to, but, and also to pay for that, we'll have to pay beginning June 1st from Fund 119, which is the balance of the EP settlement funds. Uh, in addition to that, the escrow money that we're putting in that, that will be refunded by the restore funds when, they're, when they come in is also coming from that BP settlement fund 119. All right. Need a motion? Motion. I got a motion by Commissioner Second. McDaniel. Second by Commissioner Rogers. Any further board discussion on on this issue? 
Anyone in the public on this? One in the public. Any opposition to the motion? Motion passes 5 and 0. Oh. That's all I have at this time. Thank you, sir. Mr. Novak. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. Uh, I have one item to start the meeting this morning. It's uh, with regards to your opioid litigation. Um, you have previously authorized uh, to engage our uh, special counsel. Um, they have finalized the complaints. I've discussed it with each of you commissioners. What I need this morning is an authorizing vote for the chairman to sign the resolution authorizing us to commence uh, once the complaint and summons are in their final form for us to go ahead and file that with the United States District Court, Northern District of Florida. Um, and I'll be happy to answer any questions beyond my individual discussions with each of the commissioners. Any, anyone got any questions for Mr. Uh, Mr. Novak on this lawsuit? I'll put a motion on the floor that we authorize the chairman to sign the proper documents. Okay, you got a motion by Commissioner McDaniel. Second. Second by Commissioner McCrone. Any further board discussion? This litigation? Anyone in the public on this opioid litigation? Anyone? Any opposition to the motion? Motion passes 5 and 0. Oh. That's it, Mr. Snow. All right, Mr. Yeager. All right, Ms. Carey. Mr. Collinsworth. Nothing in this time, Mr. Chairman. All right, Ms. Salar. Nothing more. Terry. Yes, Mr. Joe Paul. Good morning again, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. Good morning. Uh, I'm here representing the uh, Beacon Hill Veterans Memorial Park Committee. We would like to have a groundbreaking ceremony on the 3rd of May at 10 o'clock if everyone is available. Uh, it's not going to be what I call a dog and pony show. We're going to be there with shovels, do a groundbreaking, some pictures, and just kind of get it in the paper. We'll do a, like a grand opening later when our, our area of the park is completed and everything's in place. Uh, currently in our account, we have uh, just shy of $77,000 of the 300000 we need with some other commitments that have been made. Uh, we are well on our way to the $300,000. So we kind of want to do the groundbreaking, and we're going to put a wooden thermometer up there by uh, Capital City Bank there in the park and kind of show red lines of where we are. So if we do the groundbreaking, get it in the paper, it'll help us get some awareness out. Uh, I would like to have your approval to have that groundbreaking and see if the commissioners were available on the 3rd of May at 10 o'clock to do that. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm, we gonna make, I, I'm pretty sure we're going to make time to be there. We, we, need a, we need a motion to? Uh, so move, Mr. Chairman. All right. Got a motion by Commissioner Rogers. Second. Second by Commissioner Rich. Any further board discussion? Anyone in the public on this? In the opposition to the motion, motion passes 5 and 0. We'll see you on May 3rd. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Miss Leanna, he's here today? Hi, Yes, ma'am. Mr. Houston? Yes, sir. As of uh, April the 1st, we were six months in our uh operating year we've collected from bill runs five hundred five thousand seven hundred ninety dollars and fifty five cent uh this is three thousand seven hundred and thirty one dollars less than what we had this time last year but so we expect it to pick up and uh equal out or do better all right thank you mr whitfield All right, moving right along. Mr. Roberts, got anything this morning? All right. Ms. Norris, Madam Clerk. Yes, Mr. Chairman. All right. Ms. Lynn? Mr. Chairman, I just have one item. Just yeah. wanted to remind the public that Amnesty Day is this weekend from uh, 9 to 12, and it's here at the courthouse, and that is Eastern Time. 9 to 12, Amnesty Day. This coming Saturday, yes, sir. And uh, you want to kind of give them an idea of what they're going to be accepting? 
herbicides, pesticides, paint. Um, they're also accepting scanners, copiers, uh, electronic equipment, things like that. Anything you can't put in a regular trash can. Batteries is a big one as well. All right. Thank you, ma'am. All right. Captain, you got anything? All right. All right. Moving right along. All right. Board business. Move on down to number five. We want to take the lead. Got one thing, Mr. Chairman. All right, Mr. Rich. Um, <clears throat> got a letter from the We Will Hitch Good Dixie Softball. In the past, um, they've used a Honeyville Community Center <coughs> for their end of the year banquet, and they respectfully request that the fee be waived uh, for the use again this year. And I want to make the motion to do that for them, please. All right, so I got a motion by Commissioner Rich to uh, waive the fees for the uh, Dixie Youth you say softball. Sir, I have a second. I'll second it. Yes, Mr. Sir. Chairman. Yes, sir. I got it. Uh, second by uh, Commissioner McDaniel. Any further board discussion? <coughs> Anyone in the public on this? Anyone in the public? All right. Any opposition to the mo motion? Motion passes five and zero. Oh. Still on you, Mr. Rich. That's it, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. Mr. Cohn, you want to go next? Oh, uh, you better let me go last. You want to go last? All right, all right. Go next. Okay. <laughs> go ahead. You, yes, sir. Thank you so much. I have one item. Uh, I've asked today that uh, our county extension officer, Mr. Ray, will you come on up? And uh, Mr. Pippin, would you please come up? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, while they're coming up, this is concerned with our, you know, Gulf County especially up in the Weber Hitchcock area with our Tupelo honey. This is the time of the year and we've had some issues and I've asked these two gentlemen to please come this morning and maybe answer some questions here. But uh, some of the local beekeepers, so they've approached me and the uh, commissioner. I think they, have they talked to you, commissioner? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Anyway, uh, the Tupelo honey is world famous for this area along the Apalachicola River Basin. That's probably one of the few places that this tree grows. And over the past three or four years, we've run in, we have ran into some problems. Uh, and that's the reason I've asked these gentlemen to come here. Now, we have a window of approximately three weeks. During that three week window which starts sometime in the say the last week in April through May sometimes it'll go four weeks but normally it's about a three week window that the beekeepers uh, uh, harvest the Tupelo honey which comes from the Tupelo tree the bloom on the Tupelo tree but uh, Mother Nature there's nothing we can do about that we've had cases where we'd have a heavy rains or heavy winds and that that blows the blooms away or knocks them down then the bees they can't collect so we can't do a lot with mother nature but we have some human issues that's been brought to my attention and i'm aware of it because i've, I've lived there in the area and all but the biggest I'm going to turn that crazy mess off. But anyway, there we go. We got it. Anyway, let's get back. Biggest issue we have, we have two things. We have a water issue, and all of you have been following about the, the river, the water levels in the river. Now, where that plays a factor in one thing. Then the trees. I don't know if the trees are not healthy. The Tupelo trees we're talking about, we have an issue there. I don't know. But one issue we have, and that's the reason I've asked these gentlemen, is the biggest complaint is overcrowding. Back years ago, the beekeepers here in Guff County, they all respected each other's territory. And uh, I know the, we'll just, I'll name a few, of the, we'll start with the Lanier's, the Whitfield's, the Roberts, the Griffins, uh, who some more... Uh, Smiley, he came on later, the Rishes. They were all beekeepers, and they had their, what they call their bee yards, where they staged their bees, 
and they all give each other breathing room. That way, their bees didn't interact with each other, and they could get a good flow of honey. But that was back in the day, and now things have changed. Today, we have cases where people, and I live right there, and I see it, outsiders will bring in bees, 18-wheelers. They'll just back them right in a place. And they really are not, they don't make their livelihood on two blow honey. As soon as they collect what they can get, and they take off in New Mexico, California, for pollination, they'll probably $75 a hive to set a hive of bees out to help pollinate. And that's how they make, and when they come in, the local beekeepers, they say, well, you know, we got, we picked up a disease in our bee that we haven't seen. So the whole thing is, I've asked, and it's all under the Department of Agriculture, and the state of Florida has a control, I know that. But we're here today to have it on record here in the county and to get some input and go to work on this. What are we going to do? To, we can't do anything this year because they're right in the middle. They're starting right now for the Tupelo, and it'll be over by the middle, middle of uh, probably May. Yeah. It's over. But anyway, that's the reason I've asked these gentlemen. But we do, and, and uh, it's so... Oh, we call it this beautiful honey that we have here, but it's really been depleting down. The beekeepers are not overcrowding. That's one thing. We've got a tree issue. I feel like I was over on the Apalachicola, no, Chipola, yeah, Chipola River last, the Saturday was a week ago, and I was looking at the blooms, and they just don't look healthy. So we've got a combination of things, and I've asked these gentlemen. So, Ray, if you want to introduce Mr. Pippin here to the board or, yes. and all, and, and give us what you can yes, on sir. this. You, yes, you sir. understand it. I've talked with you. <laughs> yes, sir. Good morning, uh, Mr. Chair and Commissioners. Uh, yeah, we definitely have an issue with Tupelo trees uh, in the region. Uh, there's just not enough uh, water coming down the Apalachicola River um, really to help these trees out, especially the seedlings. Uh, coming along. Uh, they need to be inundated with water and there's just so many back creek areas um, that are just dry yeah. uh, unfortunately but um, that's one side of the coin. The other side of the coin is is uh, other beekeepers coming into our area as well and I'll let uh, Mr. Jeff Pippen with Florida Department of Ag kind of speak more to that. Well I grew up in beekeeping. Uh, my dad was a commercial beekeeper up in Bluntstown. Uh, we grew up in it we lived in the good old days uh, before the Royal Mai got here in the 1980s and started really hurting the beekeepers. Um, we lost about a third of our operation that spring in the middle of one of the prettiest city flows you've ever seen due to varroa mites. Okay, Well, we've been fighting those mites for about 30 years. I started with the Department of Ag about 15 years ago, um, and we fought with those varroa mites, and we've got them under a lot better control. When I started with the Department of Ag, there's about a quarter of a million hives in the state of Florida. Now there's about 650,000 hives. So we've about tripled in our, in our hive, okay? There were 985 beekeepers when I started 15 years ago. Now there's 4,800 beekeepers. So as you can see, beekeeping has been big in Florida. Uh, the honey they do produce, the price of it's went up a little better. We've learned how to control some of these pests, but they still are a pest. That varroa mite can be transferred from bee to bee. When they go out working a bloom, one bee gets on the bloom work, another one comes along behind him, one of those varroa mites can jump on him taxi back to their beehive and start engulfing that population. And once those royal get into a hive, they can kill them out in three months. So beekeepers have to be very aggressive in their management of their colonies. It's not like the good old days. When I grew up, you get good queen stock, you kept American fowl brood out of your hives, you could build all the bees you wanted to build. And there's 22 million people in Florida now. There was 12 million back then. <laughs> that was 30 years ago. So the population of people and bees has grown greatly. And Tupelo is such a special honey, and we've always marked it as a special honey, that the price of it's about twice what the, ne the nearest table grade honey can come to in the barrel. Um, there's guys getting five or six dollars a pound wholesale in the barrel for Tupelo a few years ago, and the closest thing to it was like the low bush gallberry and orange was getting about two and a half a pound. So it's they're sought after because of the price. But it's like I said, when you over forage Tupelo, Back in the good old days, if somebody sat close to your apiary and you found out about it, you could go talk to them and generally they'd move because if you put too many hives there, there's not going to be any more blooms in that area than there is. And if you don't, you have a few hives there and they can make a lot of honey 
When you have a lot of hives there, and they make a little honey. So you're wasting resources with those bees. You come somewhere else on another crop making more honey. So a lot of us trying to educate the beekeepers along these lines, and we try to. We have had a problem with Tupelo. The last five years, 2015, I cut samples off some trees and sent it off to get analyzed, and there was a fungal blight in the bloom, and there was very little nectar made that year. And what they did make was not very good high-grade stuff. It was really red, dark. Um, last year, I cut samples down in Sumatra, cut samples right up here north of Weewall, cut samples over on Chipola. All of those samples came back showing a bacterial blight in the bloom. And you could stand under those trees with that beautiful bloom on them and not hear a bee up there. So that's the other problem with Tupelo. We're not producing Tupelo like we could. What was made last year was horrible looking. Most of it was mixed with so many other things it wouldn't even grade out as Tupelo honey. To grade Tupelo, they send off samples. Uh, Texas A&M University does a very good job of analyzing the pollen content of honey samples, and they can tell you the percentage of pollen of each crop that's in there. And very little of that graded for Tupelo last year. So you've got a very sought after plant that's not doing well, that's over foraged. And that's the combination. That's why you're having people getting so upset. Because people like myself, who's used to having bees out there in the good old days, you could stack them up as high as you want to on Tupelo. In two and three weeks time, they'd make more honey off that crop than to make off anything else because it's so plentiful. And then we've got the rivers. I've seen creeks and stuff that have dried out and I've had complaints from beekeepers or their neighbors, that the bees were flying in their horse pens. You get out there in the creek that had been there forever that the bees normally got water from would be completely dried up. Well, Tupelo needs that water. It has to have that water to grow. So that's, we've got all these issues that have culminated into this problem. And all we can really do is regulate bees according to the, the laws and statutes. I sent each of you an email this morning that quotes the, the statute and the Florida Administrative Code that governs beekeeping for any beekeeper. Then uh, about five years ago, we developed a best management requirement because we have so many people and we're starting to have a lot of issues with neighbors and bees. And they developed this code and I attached a copy of that form. And it limits the number of hives they can have per, per acreage. It also requires they keep a water source out, that they keep the bees at least 15 feet from their boundary line or put a six foot barrier up. Things like just common sense issues so that their bees won't aggravate the neighbors. Um, we still have an issue with bees in swimming pools, and people are trying to develop something that make them not like swimming pools, but they love the chlorination in those pools, and they love the salt in the salt pools. Um, so they still do, that's one of our big complaints is bees in pools. Um, we're working on that as best we can. But as far as dealing with this, we do have out-of-state beekeepers. If they come in here, if you let me know, I'll make sure that if they aren't being inspected, that I add on my list and get them inspected. Um, because disease, in California each year, almonds, the end of, of January, everybody sends bees to almonds. Um, they need about a million hives out there. There's only two and a half million hives in the whole United States. About a fourth of those spend half the year or more in Florida, okay? So we send bees out there. This last year we sent 600 semi-loads, around 300,000 colonies from Florida that went out there. Um, when you put them out there with that hodgepodge of 23 other states that bees come in there from, they're going to be in contact with other bees. If there's any kind of pest and pestilence, they pick it up. We do our very best to analyze those hives. I test them for varroa mites. I can do that in the field. I can test them for Nosema serrana, which is a spoil infection. I can do that in the lab. Um, we do our best to make sure <coughs> that bees have an issue. We find out what it is and give the beekeeper some kind of course. Hey, these are some things that work. Give them some options and let them choose what they want to to control it. But they try to keep their bees as healthy as we can. We've been successful in Florida. Our population has grown immensely, but it's also caused us some issues in the process. So that's kind of what we've been working for and, and kind of our mentality. I'm an old time beekeeper. Used to, if a man sat next to you and you talked to him, he'd move his bees over. If you'd been there for 50 years, you know, three generations, he would move over and be respectful. Now we have to go to the laws, unfortunately. And if it's on agricultural land, and, and if it's not close to a tethered animal, if it's close to a stable, they need about a 150-foot boundary. If it's close to a church, a school, anywhere there's a congregation of people, they need to be at least 150 feet away. That's the law, okay? So that is one thing, you, common sense thing, if there is a park, church, anything like that within 150 feet, they're going to have to move them. Um, normally, if it's just an issue of conflict beekeepers next door to each other, 
we try to talk to them, try to get them to do what we can, but we've got to go by the letter of the law. So, um, but I've given you guys a copy of that, so you've got the letter of the law, and you can kind of see what we're dealing with. And we just try to be as, you know, we're trying to keep everybody as happy as we can. These landowners, a lot of these guys that come in here, it's like I had an incident the other day, a guy called me. Hey, guy wants to sit 100 hives on my land for, for Tupelo. He says, uh, how many can you put on here? I said, how big is your property? He said, less than a quarter of an acre. I said, you can put three hives there. <laughs> So yeah, that's the thing we run into. They offer these people $1,000, $2,000 to sit bees on their property for a couple of weeks, and a lot of times they don't call and ask us. Um, now, if you make me aware of it, and I'll be glad to cooperate with any of you guys any way I can, if you see an instance where you have an issue like that, I'll get out there as fast as I can. If I can't get there that day, I'll try to get there the next morning, okay, um, and address that. Because we do try to make everybody get along as best we can. We try to accommodate that. So, But, uh... Jeff, uh, thank you, and Ray. But if we if we don't address some of these human issues, we're going to lose this. Yeah. We're going to lose it. it and is, like you said, I had a fellow offered me money to just back an eighteen wheeler, and I told him no, because nope. I've got a friend, Mr. Rich, that lives right down the street right. from me. He's a bee man. He don't keep his bees there. I told him absolutely not. Just yeah. three weeks. We just want to back in. Get what we can, we'll back up and hook, we'll be gone, and you won't even know they've been there. And putting that many hives anywhere, they're not going to make any Well, they're barging now, they're over on the, uh, the river, and they've you got barges. They'll take yeah. the barges and go down the uh, Apalachicola, or and, Chicola, and they said, well, we're over the river, but just a quarter of a mile right over there is a big bee yard right. that's been there. And the locals, they stay. Mm -hmm. They don't take their bees and go to uh right. we got uh, some old boys to keep them on platforms, they, uh, on platforms people up and we want to keep them right there year round that's their livelihood well these people it. is using them for pollination when you get 75 dollars a hive and you got uh, they make a and they make a loop all up through nebraska and do. work their way back to florida they make a circuit uh, they'll hit california they pay about 180 dollars yeah. a hive out there that's Ooh, that much had, that was 75 300,000 go out there from florida this year Hundred and eighty dollars a high. Yeah. They they can net off of a load of bees after expenses and everything. They can net about one hundred twenty five dollars to put in their pocket profit after paying the drivers, the brokers, fees per hive. Per hive. Then they bring them back. They'll take them here, get a little, get them built up again. They go up to apples or cranberries or blueberries, and they pollinate up there and make about one hundred twenty five a hive. Then they can, if they stay around here, they can do watermelons for about seventy five dollars a hive. Pollination, beekeepers have had to go to pollination because the honey flows are not here. Citrus greening down in South Florida has obliterated a huge amount of our citrus. Our citrus production is way down. And if you don't have citrus trees, you don't have citrus honey. And a lot of those guys that have bees down there are shifting up here. I've got, I was telling you, the guy from Brevard County has moved up here. He's moved his whole operation, his home and everything with about 400 hives because he just can't make anything down there. Um, but he's not necessarily after Tupelo. He's wanting to stay. He's here right. for the gallberry, the tie-dye. He's seasonal. He wants to, you know, live here. So, and I understand what you're saying when they just pull in and pull out. And we have some of that. But a lot of these guys will come down here and stay six or eight months here and build up their bees, get the Tupelo and stuff, and then move out and do pollination. So there's every different operation has a different set of, of, of ways of doing things. But these guys that flash in and flash out, if you'll let me know who they are, I can at least... Try to get out there and get them checked. Make sure they've got clean bees and try to explain to them. You can't put, I had a guy put 500 hives on one of our old places. We used to keep 30 hives there. 30 hives would do great. You could have four or five hives. He starved those 500 to death in that same location on Tupelo because there's just not that much forage there. And they don't understand. They hear all these rumors, oh, you can put on Tupelo and it just makes in two and a half weeks. You can make as much as 150 pounds, 200 pounds of honey. They don't realize this is not the old days. Tupelo is not as healthy as it was, and there's way too much, too many bees foraging on that Tupelo. Um, he he found out the hard way. He lost most of those bees. So right. we try to educate the beekeepers too, and I'll be glad to talk to any of them. If you guys have a constituent that calls you and says, "Hey, this guy's sitting bees here," I can find him. <laughs> can you look him up? Yeah, you know, if they've got me anything, a phone number, an address, or or a name, I can find him, find out who he is, where he is, and make contact with him and uh, talk to him and at least educate him on how the situation is here. All right, Jeff. Uh, we've I'm had a lot of poisoning issues a few years yep, back, too. Yeah, we did. With, and these were <laughs> local beekeepers fighting with each other. 
which was kind we don't of sad. Want that that we was don't very want that. sad. I stood there with two of them. I was pure heartbroken that the two of them going at each other like they were, um, just just greedy, and and they were both local boys that grew up here. Their families been here, but they were fighting over two play. So. All right, Jeff. Uh, I think you've answered more than answered, <laughs> okay. and I thank you for okay. coming. Ray, go back and get your books now. Study up, because I'm going to be up there. <laughs> you and I are going to be looking at each other a lot on this honey issue. Okay. I'll I, go back to the beekeepers yeah. up there. Well, if and, I can uh, help out any way I can, I'll be glad to. All right. All right. Thank you, Mr. Right. Chairman. That's, uh, oh, yeah. that's all I have. And, gentlemen, thank you. And, Jeff, okay. thank you so much. You're welcome. All right. All, right. all I have. Hold on one second. Is there anything, sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Mike Daniels, anything yes. we can we can do as far as the county? Well, I don't know. It's all under the Department of Agriculture. It's regulated through the state. Yeah, we, and as we far have. as these people, uh, you know, I, I'm a strong believer in free enterprise. Goodness gracious, and I don't like rules. I'm, uh, I'm not a big, every time you turn around, you got to have a rule to do this and a rule. To, I, I don't like that. I wasn't raised. Well, it used but to be But the old respect. It used to be a handshake, thing. you know. That was right in respect, but. but these Change. numbers, I was shocked at the number you've given me here. and uh, They're keeping us real busy. <laughs> would you please get the research to look into the tree? You're absolutely I'm right. To, in a lot I'm going to try to cut some blooms this time. It should be starting. I've been watching it. I, I checked yeah. some coming up from Perry yesterday. And so there's buds all over it, but I need a bloom. And that should That's be right. blooming now. It should be there coming. There wasn't uh, last uh, week. There wasn't. Yeah, here, here's what's happened in the, in the Tupelo, in the, in the areas of the right. trees. Uh, the Corps of Engineers, the great DEP that knows everything, uh, they don't know <laughs> nothing. And they went over on the Apalachicola River. Now all those low flats are filled with sand. I checked where they used to stand in water for six months. The Chicola River, about two years ago, a guy came down wanting to take some photographs. And we went over there, and under those trees, you could step on that muck and it would crunch. Muck that had not been dry probably in hundreds of years. And walking on there, it would just crunch under your feet right under those two plates. They won't do it. Of course, right. they made nothing. So you got to have water to make nectar. So I want to bring up one thing. Um, when I was reading, when Ray brought me that uh, material, said that out of state beekeepers got like 30 days to notify you. And, and we, that's we try to get them out. You know, if somebody sits illegally on some property, um, we have a lot of issue with that a few years back. And they have to get them off there then because it's the property owner. They say, look, you don't have permission. But now if that property owner says, yes, you've got permission to set them here, if they're sitting there and they're too close to a line or something, we give them two weeks to move them back. Um, if they're, you know, it depends on the situation, but we have to give them some notice to move it back. And if, you know, that's what we run into. What's the situation? Every situation is a little different. And we have to look at each one and look at the law on it and say, all right, this is what you're required <coughs> to do. And try to be reasonable. But is there any way they can, is there any way the state can reduce the number of days? I can talk to my boss about that. I'll have to talk to It, it just seems help. strange that they can come in and set up and do business and be gone in and out and it's, never have to report. And it's not just us that has that issue down on Orange Blossom where they really haven't they've cut the trees. Some of them will come in on right-of-ways. They'll move them into power lines or sit them just on the side of the road. And we've had issues where we've had to get them moved and things like that. We deal with it on circumstance, each circumstance individually. But, you know, if they don't have permission to be there and they don't have a right to be there, we can do something about it. I just, I just want to do whatever we can to protect our local beekeeper, and yeah. our, and they are also I do too. Our hey, I am a voter, and our I grew player. up in it, and I, I love every minute of it, and I know the people, and I enjoy working with the people around here, and I know how hard they work. And if you work all year keeping your bees healthy, trying to make that crop, and if somebody wheels in a semi, and it, they're not going to make anything, and neither are you. That's not beneficial to anybody. The ones that are coming in on the barge, are they still bound by the regulations? Those barge or? guys are, we wall natives. <laughs> okay. Yeah, the two right. guys yeah. are doing okay. that. They're, okay. they're from right here. Uh, I can take you up their honey house there in Dalkeith. Um, but they're from here. Okay. Uh, but they just tried that last year. They tried it and had some success with it. Um, some other guys have got platforms. They live in Appalachia down there that they've put bees on for years and years, and they, they work under the um, water management down there. They have permits to put them on there, and they allow them to keep them up. But there's not a lot of that barging, but those guys have tried a little of it. And I don't know, that if you put them out in the middle of the swamp out there, you're probably not harming somebody that's sitting up on the hill a ways. But like you said, if they're sitting right mm -hmm. there and you move that barge right in, you're encroaching either one of you. It's going to cut your crops, both of you. And that's the problem. If you make one box around on a, on each hive, 
that's not much. If you make five boxes on that hive, you've done something. You've had a pretty good crop and you may be able to pay your bills this year. Uh, but that one box, that's not going to be enough to do anything. That's just going to be an aggravation to have to go through and pull all that off and extract it. And we try to explain that to the beekeepers and try to get them to cooperate with each other. Like I said, in the good old days, local people understood that and you work with each other. But uh, we've, things have changed. <laughs> it's not what it was 30 years ago, I can tell you. <laughs> I guess the demand for that, that type of honey also is driving the market. Tupelo, a pound bought jar of Tupelo along the coast down there will sell for $23, $25, no problem. And even inland here, $17, $18 a pound for a one pound jar. And as long as the market's strong mm -hmm. and the demand's that good, probably going to have things we have to deal with. <laughs> but like I say, we try to be as fair as we can with everybody, and uh, we go by the law. We have to go by what's in the book. That's, uh, that's what we try to enforce. So um, we try to be as nice about it as we can, but we do have to hold it to this. Uh, and like I say, but anything I can do to help, or if I can talk to somebody, or if you have somebody that's questionable, let me know about them. I'll check into it and find out if they're registered and if they're sitting on land as they should be and all that because uh, this is the time of year. For the next four weeks, it gets kind of hectic for me. <laughs> but I'll try to make myself as available as possible. Yes, sir. Appreciate it, Mr. Jeff, Mr. Ray. Thank I you. appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. That's all, Mr. Chairman. All right. Yes, sir. sir. All right. Mr. Rogers? Uh, I don't have anything. Thank you. Yes, sir. Mr. <coughs> McCrone. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Got a couple of things. I'm gonna take the easy one first. And then we uh, uh, got a letter from a young lady. I just want to recognize her. Uh, she wrote me a letter. She's a sixth grader at uh, Fort St. Joe Elementary, and she was concerned about the, the the cut in funding to the SWAT program. And uh, just want to recognize her. That's that's a that's been a very valuable program over the years. And and uh, if if you've ever seen somebody with uh, lung cancer, it's, it's devastating. And what cigarettes can do and I just wanted to recognize her. Her name is uh, uh, Sarah Durham. She's a sixth grader at Port St. Joe Elementary, and I uh, just wanted to recognize her this morning. I ain't read. All right, you still have the floor. Okay. Next item. Uh, gentlemen, we... Bad as I hate it, I'm going to open this up this morning, but we have an RV ordinance, and I've had a lot of calls lately, and people are really concerned about what's going on with pole barns and, and RVs. Uh, certain areas, we can you can have a pole barn with an RV without having a primary structure. And I can understand the concerns of some of these people. They, they've built homes. They, they've... Uh, I've been here in the community for years, and, and they're seeing these pole barns with, with RVs, and they have a lot of concerns. I've got, I've got probably uh, 30 or 40 names here of a petition that was signed uh, by people in the community, uh, especially in, in uh, the Oak Grove area, that are very concerned. We've had a lot of issues with uh, people uh, being in compliance, being it, it, it's, at some point in time, we've got to address it as bad as I hate it, but uh, I think it impacts the value of our property. I think it when you when when some of your property is not being uh, have ha having houses built on it, it, it impacts the value. And and I just wanted to uh, get the thoughts of the board this morning and and see if Mr. Novak can. I don't know what the ultimate. Uh, fix is to it but but uh i see it becoming a major major problem so. you want to address some of the snowback or what you got i'd like mr novak to look into it and see if there's any you know what solutions or anything we can do these people are you know uh, i've had a lot of calls and they're concerned i mean and, and rightly so uh Uh, primarily in my area in District 5, you know, Oak Grove area, which was exempted out when the original RV ordinance was done. So, um. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Go ahead, uh, Mr. Novak. Um, I've discussed this with the commissioner uh, with regards to the ordinance, and just 
the commission that sits here today, just to take you back, um, the, the commission really started grappling with this in 2010, moving forward. Um, the issue came up a couple times over the f about three or four year period. Um, a couple times the ordinances and public hearings were introduced and turned down by your predecessors. Um, it was adopt you adopted an RV ordinance, the county commission in 15. Um, it's since been amended, I think, three different occasions. Um, if you, uh, the RV ordinance originally started, it was all encompassing for the entire county. Um, over public hearings and discussions amongst the commission, they narrowed that scope to the coastal construction corridor, and the county defined that through ordinance. Um, it used state science and the Florida Housing Building Code to define that was within a mile of the coastline and open waters. Um, county commission then came back at a later date and amended that ordinance once again and pulled out three coastal areas, uh, Jones Homestead, Highland View, and Oak Grove. Um, those were not on as defined by the state on open waters. They were internal on the bay um, and were not exposed as the as Indian Pass, Cape Sandblast, and St. Joe Beach are. Um, so we've amended that ordinance um, historically over the last three years. Uh, right now, and speaking with Commissioner McCrone um, and the issues that he's dealing with, right now the Oak Grove area is not under your county ordinance. So the areas I just defined are not um, they're, they're, they're dealt with by the land development regulations, which is one RV per parcel, but the, the RV ordinance uh, three years ago, in, in effect, took, if you purchased a piece of property after 2016 in January, you could come down with an RV and visit your property along the coastal corridor and stay for a few weeks a year with a permit from the county. However, if you've purchased that property after that date, you couldn't come down and put your RV down and leave it year-round. And I think Commissioner McCrone uh, obviously has seen an issue with these structures going up and people putting the RVs in. The area that we're speaking of is not under the ordinance. Um, for me to go back, I would need an authorizing vote of the commission to go back and look at that and you know, review that and, and notice public hearings. You're required to do that by state statute. Um, and then open the discussion up for this commission to look at that ordinance. Um, and I will take any you know, direction from the commissioners. As I do, I'll meet with each of you individually. Uh, take your input and also have those public hearings in the months to come uh, if that's your wishes. I just need an authorizing vote as we do with any ordinance amendment to do so. Thank you, Mr. Novak. Mr. Crown, you still have the floor. Uh, like I said, I can understand the concern of these people and, and you know, we've dealt with a lot of issues in Oak Grove uh, and their concerns are valid, and and I'll, you know, whether it goes anywhere or not, I'll, I'll make a motion this morning that we we let Mr. Novak look into it, and come back with a you know some form of recommendation. That's my motion. All right, I got a motion by Commissioner McCrone to let uh, Mr. Attorney go back and review the ordinance. Do uh do I have a second? I'll second, it, Mr. Chairman. I got a second by Commissioner Rich. Uh, any further uh, board discussion? Discuss. Let me say this, yes, uh, sir. Mr. Chairman. Uh, and by no means that I, do I think the RV ordinance should go away. Um, it, it does do. You know, we don't need to go back to the LDRs, but at the same time, I don't know what the ultimate fix is to this, but. We'll, we'll go from here. Any uh, any further uh, board discussion? Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Mr. Go ahead, uh, Commissioner McDane. Uh, Hawking. Grove is that? Just at the south end, yes, sir. Yes, sir, not. Oak Grove. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oak Grove. Primarily, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, yes. Research. That's yeah. this whole thing is just research that's your motion yes sir. him to research it and go back report back here to the board yes sir thank you mr mr chairman if i may yes, sir, mr. Novak. It, and i i understand there's a second um I, I believe it's open for a discussion amongst yes. the commission at this point um to provide you some additional insight um each of the commissioners they're dealing with i think commissioner mcdaniel was the only one obviously that first dealt with it when it came through the commission that sits here today is the new issue one of the things that we you do need to take into consideration is when we open the issue up, um, you're discussing Oak Grove. 
the other areas will be on the table as well. Um, and I say that because you have a pocket that you're dealing with and an issue. The other areas that you pulled out and you excluded from the ordinance, they will be dealt with as well. And in terms of the legal analysis of it, when you start picking areas, you, you this commission needs to be mindful of spot zoning. Okay, And so when you pick an area, you have an issue, you deal with it, you justify it. What we've done is we've pulled out three areas. We've used state science to exclude those areas. This, the county does not have the resources as we did, went through this the first time to provide you with science that would pull it out. So when we do bring this issue up, those three, those two other areas in addition to Oak Grove will be on discussion as well. So basically, you're saying that if once we go back, once you go back and review it, all those areas, all, all those areas on the table, and we can't come back and say, okay, we're just going to pull this area out, Oak Grove, and it would be my recommendation that when this commission deals with one area, it deals with all areas. And that would be my recommendation to this commission, that you deal with the issue universally as a whole. You've excluded certain areas. All those areas will be on the table for discussion as well as the ordinance. Just the areas that were exempted out originally, Jerry? If that is that, that is my recommendation, and if that's the direction of this commission, but that is correct. Okay. All right, I got a, I got a second by our Commissioner Rich. Anyone in the public on this issue? I'd like to speak. Come on up, sir, and state your name. The address for the record, please. Good morning, gentlemen. County Commissioners. My name is Chris Wall. I live at 215 Madison Street, out in Oak Grove. So, I'm going to be honest with you. I wasn't here when this ordinance was passed. I grew up here. I was born here. Most of you, half at least, more than half of you know me. We've been vocal about the situation. It's had a negative impact on our community, just in general. And just to point out, if you read the actual document that was provided, we understand it's not an Oak Grove issue. And it's not an Oak Grove issue. And one of the questions I have, actually for Mr. Novak or the commission in general, is is my understanding that St. Joe Beach is affected by this as well. That that's allowed there. I need to grab a sheet of paper real quick. Is that is that not an affected area as well? Because there are pole barns out there that are being advertised as homes. There's people, think, things that are going on in Oak Grove, and it, is it, Jeremy, is um, Mr. Novak, is St. Joe Beach not? You're asking me if St. Joe Beach has, in, in my opinion, has an issue with this? No, is it not, in, because it goes I, on out there. Is it not, yeah, it, it's not included in the ordinance? No, the ordinance affects St. Joe Beach. So the jurisdiction for this ordinance reaches St. Joe Beach. If you're, I don't have an opinion as to whether it's an issue or a problem. What I'm saying is the ordinance applies to St. Joe Beach. So the rules are in place there. Well, there separate issue altogether my, my understanding was that it, this was even an issue as far as the, the ordinance because of the tip of the um, Cape actually protected St. Joe Beach and if you look at the coastal corridor it comes out to the tip of the Cape to be honest with you because I personally I, I know I've seen advertisements for pole barns at St. Joe Beach being sold as homes that affects the property value out there I've driven out there there are um, campers RVs being used constantly I'm not here to solve the world's problems but what I am here is it's not fair to those people it's not fair to the people of Grove it's not fair to the people uh, that own property on 30A there's um it's decreased our property value my father which this part gets me emotional he worked and he lost his job when the mill was shut down and I apologize All right. my dad he wants to leave his home because of this ordinance that tears me up if you can't help. He's a man that has been here for this community. Hold he works hard. Hold on one second, Mr. Wall. Can I get a motion? So move. Got a motion by Commissioner McCrone to extend time. Get a second. Second. Second by Commissioner Rich. Go ahead. So I'll regather myself on that. Sorry. Sorry. It, it's, it's personal there. As I was saying, it's um, affected our property values. 
you can go out there there's a couple things with that there when it comes to the pro it's not just it doesn't just affect oak grove it doesn't just affect st joe beach it doesn't just affect any of these areas that were excluded the taxes that are brought in the revenue off of that it's at best barely above unimproved land that amount of money is significant that could pay teacher salaries could pave roads provide free lunches for children whatever it could be used for something that is value to this county that affects everybody it doesn't just affect me it doesn't just affect the people that live in those areas second to that there's already approximately 15 of them out there these pole barns half the time they the building departments dealt with it we've called the people don't get permits half the time or a significant amount of time i can't quote exact stats on that they don't get them the penalty for that is that they just have to pay a double pen, double cost of the um permit when that happens we there's no respect out there for the property there's no respect they even for that for the rules for the permit we've been there we've seen it we've heard it uh, the rest of y'all aren't there we've heard them say we don't have to do what these laws say we've physically heard them standing in the street they treat it and i would hope that when the board approved this before that they were acting trying to act in the best interest of the county or attempting to but at this point there is none of this that's in the best inter interest of this county as a whole that property is being used as a campground period it's not people just having fun they're sitting out there they're partying they're staying up all night they're lighting fires it's literally being used as a campground where people live which is a decrease in the property value of the good people who have stayed there and been in this situation the long and short of it is people invested in that property because the natural growth of that property would be to expand out and build nice homes i live in a nice home love it my dad lives in a nice home that's the natural progression of property and real estate there, once the property runs out people have to move outward they they rebuild they establish more property they establish better property at this point we've established where that's going to be a campground forever there are people who are out there i know for factual it's fact that are leasing these out for more than you can rent a house and they're not even supposed to be leasing that out to other people that's not the owner they lease these things for 800 to a thousand dollars a month and i'm pretty sure those aren't paying any of the um, tourist development taxes on that as well but there is no i get it i've been told you know this happens every so often with it goes with the real estate market up now where people can afford this isn't that people this is all they can afford to do these people have money they're using it for a vacation and just throw all and it's not fair to this community second to that they're being built these pole barns i don't know specifically if there's a code to how they're supposed to be built in a certain way but they're not i can promise you we've seen them being built if a hurricane comes through there that's going to blow through on everybody else's property and destroy it not only will it blow that way hurricane comes through there along 30a or anything depending on the direction of the winds it'll blow all that debris out in the bay or in the property it has the possibility of doing that i live down south i've been through hurricane charlie i've seen the devastation we've all seen it in some way or another i just i would hope that they, the board would allow um mr novak to take the time to research this because it, it truly impacts it's a long term they're, the only people that are benefiting from this are realtors and a few people who bought pro either bought property in the height of the last real estate market and they're trying to get rid of it now and trying to find a way still to capitalize rather than take a big loss or realtors there's nobody <laughs> else making money off that property or benefiting from it that's a very limited number of residents in this county who are benefiting from the utilization of that property being that way and now there's even more plans for developments to accommodate the same situation in that area and we'd like to see something done about it to preserve our property values and preserve revenue for the county in the future that's all okay thank you mr wall anyone anyone else in the public on this issue you state your name and your address for the record please my name is Lorinda Gingell and I live at 435 Madison 
Okay. Um, the one issue that um, Chris didn't bring up, and I heard y'all talking about having to fix roads. The roads over in Oak, Gro Oak Grove are um, quaint. To, with all the RVs that are coming in and out, there's going to be significant impact to in the infrastructure over there, to the sewer level, to the water, to the roads in particular. Okay, they're closing in more of the culverts so that the water, a lot of the stormwater then sits on top of the streets, okay, and doesn't drain out because it can't get into one of the culverts anymore because somebody put dirt in a pipe over it. Okay, so I, I just want to examine also those impacts that we are going to have in that neighborhood. They are also looking at cutting down a lot of the trees and the greenery. Um, and it's Oak Grove. Okay, it's, you know, not just an open field. So please put that as well as part of the consideration when it's going to end up costing the county, which you are not getting back from those properties. Okay, you're not getting the, the tax, you're not getting bed tax from the RVs that constantly going in and out. And if you live on Madison, you get to see them all coming in and out on a regular basis. Um, you also get to see the maneuvers they have to make in order to get into these lots, because these suckers are big, okay? Um, and you have people who, they have a, a pole barn with a tool time shed that has become a th two or three bedroom apartment, you know, with a dish and a, refer you know, a full kitchen, air conditioning. And they come down in their car and stay in that while they rent the front section out, the pad, to, to somebody else. And you know, my guess is, first of all, they're not supposed to be living in the shed. It is not anywhere close to our construction codes having just dealt with our construction codes, you know, it's like it just isn't supposed to be. You know, we were told you're not supposed to get more than 30 amp service into a shed. And don't tell me you can run kitchen, air conditioning, all that stuff on 30 amps, okay? So just the, the implications and the money that the county is losing, okay, by having this sort of kind of free-for-all and what it's gonna cost us in the future to maintain those neighborhoods. We're still responsible for the streets you know, and it's like, I know we, we have gas tax to take care of that. The gas tax only goes so far. When you have a problem, potholes, we don't go to the gas tax for that. We just go to public works. So thank you very much. Thank okay. you. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Unfortunately, I'm going to have to talk about this issue because <laughs> it's, it's, it's been a nightmare for staff ever since the RV ordinance come up. But we're... I think we're, we've expanded beyond the RV ordinance, so I, I, I'm just trying to get clarification of what you want staff to look at, because the RV ordinance is is an animal unto itself. But that is that is just that it has nothing to do with pole barns. And even though I agree that is that is part of this problem, the RV ordinance does not address pole barns. So that's one issue. The other issue that I know that I've talked to Chris about many times. We've sent letters. Something that's unique about Oak Grove that is not the same for Highland View or, or other areas is Oak Grove is a residential neighborhood. They can't legally rent uh, RV slots out in lots where they can in Highland View and other places that are mixed commercial residential. So th there are teeth. We had a dozen people with signs up. We sent letters to all of them. If they have a sign up that says they're renting RV lots, we, the county sends them a sign to, to pop them. If they're living in pole barns, we're, we're working on that. I mean, there are a lot of people that, that, that break the rules all the time, and, and the building department tries to respond to those. You can build a pole barn that is livable if you permit it correctly, and it's designed and engineered correctly. But most of the ones where they're doing it, they're, they're doing it illegally, and the, and the building department is, is working on that. But I, the, the, the problem in Oak Grove that the, that the residents, the long-term residents have is a natural result of the RV ordinance. We, the county, we shoved RVs into into Oak Grove and Highland View because that's the only place on the south end of the county they could do it. And and you know, and I'll leave my personal opinions out of it. The RV ordinance has been a major headache for the county and for residents for the last what, four four years. And it's been amended several times, and it, it's it's been a nightmare to enforce. Uh, we we sent out I don't know how many letters, 60, 70 letters. For people that violated the RV ordinance when they didn't evacuate them for the for the storm, it, it's it's almost impossible to enforce the way it is today. It was a cyclical cycle, and, and I understand that a lot of people at the Cape were complaining. If you live in a in a in a 
association that has a homeowners association, they can prevent those things. But when people bought a million dollar lot and paid cash for it and couldn't sell it for a hundred thousand, they brought their RV down until the cycle changed. They don't have that problem today. It was going to settle out on its own. But what we've done is, since we can't allow it in all these other areas, they are, they're really only two places for them to go, Oak Grove and Highland View, and that's where they've gone. So if, if you could direct us in what you want us to look at, the, the RV ordinance is not all of what was brought up today. We've talked about RVs, we've talked about pole barns, we've talked about renting in residential neighborhoods. We can handle that on the LDR side, but if you want us to do more than just look at the RV ordinance, we just need some direction from the board. Uh, Michael, I think the concern, <clears throat> just talking to the people, is when you've got a vacant lot, and I think they would like to see you don't have a primary structure, you can't just throw a pole barn up, you know, and without a any kind of primary structure. And that's what's going on. And, you know, some people have They've got a lot up. There's one place on, I'll go ahead and say it, on C30 that's got RV sitting there, nothing else. I mean, I mean, if I built a house, I'd be upset too. You know, so that, that's their concern. But Y'all good? Chairman, let me. If yes, sir. Go ahead, Mr. I've been involved with this from. Yes, day one. Hammond said we went through some journey, some bumpy situations. It's hard to please everybody. And we, as a board, we're not out to hurt anyone. We just want to try to compromise with everyone. But uh, from what I've heard here today, and it's serious, this isn't something to just brush off. But. Uh, I don't know if the answer is to, as I prior with the beep, I hate laws and rules and regulations, but uh, sometimes you have to have them. And I really, uh, we have a motion on the floor, and Mr. H, you've second the motion here, but that's not asking the board to do whatever they want to do, but uh, maybe we might order, maybe look into this, come back. Sit down one on one, and Hammond said the RV is pretty well set. This pole barn issue. It's not only an oak grove, I see it up in my neighborhood. Agriculturally, you can build a pole barn, correct me, where's your. Uh, that, that, there is, Mr. I can go here, I, my <coughs> land, I have enough land, it's, I know it's agriculture, some of it. If I want to just build a pole barn, put my tractors under it, I don't even think I have to be permitted. That's what it's supposed to be, but then the next thing you know, I go concrete it, I build me a nice, uh, anyway, it quits being a place to park a tractor under. I think that's what's happening. Used. I don't have the answers to it right now, but I have more experience on it than any of you, and I know we have really had some rounds about this. <laughs> Polish an ordinance, this RV ordinance. I think it's working. And it, Hammond said out on the Cape primarily, the market's going back up, and a person that can afford to buy one of those lots out there and pay the taxes all can probably going to put a nice structure out there drag up an old yellow school bus with a gas bottle on the back of it and call that home. I just don't see that. But anyway, uh, I don't know. I just like us to look into it a little bit. That's all. Thank you, Mr. All right. Chairman. Right. I'm, I'm through now. Mr. Hold on a second, Mr. Wall. Hold on a second. Mr. McCall, you got anything? Uh, I'm good. Um, for the record, I'm going to enter these petitions into work. Okay, you're going you're gonna to enter the petition. So, Mr. Uh, Mr. Wall, are you going to come? Just, yes, just, I just want to follow up to that real quick. That statement says two statements about uh, There seems to be some confusion about what we're asking. All right, come on up. We're, we're not asking to abolish the RV ordinance by any means. If you read the petition. Oh, no, I, I understand that. I clearly understand we're that. Not, uh, there's different needs on other ends of the county. 
where Commissioner McDaniel's at, there's different needs, there's different values, different utilizations. And I don't want it, almost seems like that we're trying to say the RV ordinance. I can't speak to what Mr. Hammond has to deal with every day out of the Cape. It seems to work out there, just like Commissioner McDaniel just said. We're asking for the same respect for our property values for that to occur out there. And as far as the pole barns, I, there should be a rule. I mean, that is a separate issue about having those as a primary structure. Out of, and where the is that allowed? Where the RV ordinance is in place that you can put a pole barn up as a primary structure? Because that wasn't what we we're addressing. But essentially, we would like to see the same respect that is given for for those properties out there, because that's the natural development of, in my opinion, of real estate moving inland. That's when the property and values start going up. Thanks, sir. Uh, anyone else in the public on this issue? Anyone else in the public? All right, we got a motion by uh, Commissioner Macron to uh, go back and uh, review the ordinance. Um, Mr. Novak said it's not going to open up that one area, but it's going to open up all the other areas you're going to have to look at also. And I got a second by uh, Commissioner Rich. Uh, any opposition to the motion? Any opposition to the motion? All right, motion passes 5 and 0 to go back and review. Mr. Crow, you still got the floor? That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. That's enough, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> <laughs> all right, and. Oh, yeah. Uh, so everyone knows uh, oh, yeah. we did get the speed, speed limit, limit changed on C30. So. From 45 to 55 in that section from Jasmine Lane to, to where the 45 sign was. Okay. Okay. Great. Right. That, that may have been the fastest state government work that I have ever seen. We met with them on a, that was, yeah, but we, we met with them on site. They basically told us no. Commissioner McCrone, Mr. Yeager, and myself met with them. And within 10 or 11 days, we had a letter saying they were going to increase, the, and, and Mark got it. 10 or 11 days, they were going to increase the deal. So that was quick action from those folks. So we'll send them a thank you letter. Absolutely. That's all I have, Mr. Chair. All right. Change from 45 to 55. That's good. That means don't go 65. Because <laughs> the sheriff's office is going to be out there waiting on you. All right. Uh, and the chair. The chair has. The, the chair doesn't have anything either. All right. Move on down to item number six. Mr. Collinsworth, that's you. Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the first on the variance from PDRB, we have a variance request uh, from David and Heidi Rehack. Uh, location parcel ID number 03249-005R, southern portion of lot 19, Cape Palm subdivision. Subdivision recorded in plat book one, page 53, uh, the public records in Gulf County, line south of State Road. Uh, State Road 30B requesting a roadside setback variance to build nine feet six inches into a 10 foot egress easement. This is the one that uh, Mr. Floor was speaking of this morning. Mr. Chairman, if I may. Yes, sir, Mr. Nova. Uh, just uh, just to re as I do each meeting, just to recap your procedural summary. Um, the plan, uh, the Board of County Commission has served formal notice for the the variance application today. Um, it complies with the LDR. It's been posted on the courthouse. It's been pub publicly advertised. Um, the preliminary review and recommendations of the Gulf County PDRB are being offered to you today through Mr. Collinsworth. The applications will be heard. Um, today, as it always is, there is a quasi-judicial setting and proceeding in which you'll follow. Um, the proceeding will provide for the parties to be able to present evidence, opportunity for parties to be heard, um, and question the evidence submitted to the record and be informed of all facts upon which the Commission chooses to act. Um, these requirements may also be waived, as you've done in the past, by the Board of County Commission uh, only upon the waiver of all parties that come forward that wish to comment on this, be it the public, the applicant, any opposition, or staff. Um, any, If it is a proceed under a quasi-judicial, I'd ask the clerk's office to swear everybody in uh, prior to commencing with your hearing. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. All right, is, this, is there uh, anyone who wishes to speak uh, on the item, on this item? If you're here, to, if you want to speak on this item, please step forward. Yeah. Thank you. Just one minute. I think, Mr. Chairman, the applicant 
is represented by Mr. Husband, and we always start with the applicant. Okay, I'm sorry, um, sir. And then you can, but if you can, just have them all read their name into the record and have uh, Ms. Leanna or Ms. Norris swear them all in. Yes, sir. Go ahead and state your name for the record and who you, and who you represent, and then uh, we'll get Ms. Adam Clerk to swear you in. Yes, sir. My name is Jack Husband. I'm here to represent Mr. David Rehack and, and Ms. Heidi Rehack. Okay. Ms. Floyd. Uh, Patrick Floyd, Monument Avenue, Port St. Joe. I'm here to represent Karen and Jim Biddy, the Upland uh, adjacent property owners and the owner of, I mean, the one who has the easement down the side. So, Chairman, uh, yes. and if you would ask the applicant, the, uh, uh, Attorney Floyd, anybody from the public, if anybody waves or objects okay. to the waiver of the quasi judicial. All right, does it do you, any, anyone in the public or you guys object to quasi judicial hearing procedures? Let, let me say this. I think we can, because of the fact that we, this particular part, that there may be some other people out there, but as to ours, we have reached an agreement regarding the variance, um, and therefore um, we're submitting that in settlement or resolution of the issue. Um, and to the extent of the quasi judicial hearing, we don't need that particular part because of the resolution. Um, if there's anybody else out I'll there, check. they may need to. But as yeah. far as I, is that right, Jack? I, I, I will not object. Okay. Is anybody in the in the public object to quasi judicial being waived? I make a motion we waive it. All right. I got a motion to waive quasi judicial hearing. Second. Second by Commissioner McCrone. Any further board discussion? Any opposition? I right, to waive uh, quasi judicial. Motion passes five and zero. All right. We're gonna. Swear them in. There's no, there's no need you to need do to that. We in. just let the applicant make his presentation. Okay. You can go from there, Mr. Clinton. All right, Mr. Husband. You got cool. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I will do my best to be brief and, and spare you from what the planning board went through last Monday. Um, I'm here to represent Mr. David and Ms. Heidi Rehack um, for parcel number 03249-005R. The property is along Indian Pass Road, and um, a portion of the Camp Palm subdivision is actually lot 19 of the Camp Palm subdivision, um, which is a 1953 plat. Um, in the variance application, we were um, asking for, there is a, well, let me, let me back up. There's a 10-foot easement that was placed when the property uh, was purchased by Mr. Rehack um, for the seller. So she can still have access. So her family can still have access to the Gulf. Um, the, I guess this got a little sideways when the discussion turned from an easement to roadway. So a 10-foot easement um, is navigable by um, all-terrain vehicle, utility vehicle, things of that nature. Um, so all, all that aside, we were asking um, there's a, a huge difference uh, on a roadside setback than there is on a side setback. So 10, a roadside setback would be 20 foot off of the easement line, which would be 30 foot of unusable property for Mr. Rehack, for my client, Mr. Rehack. So we were asking to be a half a foot off of the 10 foot easement. So in discussions with Mr. Floyd, since the planning board voted to deny the, <clears throat> the variance based on lack of information, and that information basically is whether it's navigable by a vehicle in 10 feet, um, it, 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 et cetera. So if um, the, in discussions with Mr. Floyd since last Monday's planning board meeting, we have come to an agreement with my client and Mr. Floyd's client uh, to be five foot off of the easement, which would be 15 foot off the property line. And that's that's essentially it. Thank you, Mr. Hus. Yes, All right, sir. Mr. Floyd, you want to speak on? Did over to what Jack said, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I did want to add that uh, what we're doing is just um, there to reemphasize. There's a t the um, western boundary line of Dr. Rehack, and his wife has a uh, a ten foot easement for access to the to the Gulf. And so this is going to be uh, another five feet um, from the eastern, I guess it's southeastern really, 
eastern boundary line another five feet towards the east, uh, that that would be uh, a setback, and they will be allowed up to that point to do the building. And so that's what we agreed on. Yes, sir. 15 feet from the property line. Right. Mr. Chairman, may I? Yes, sir. Good morning, Pat. Good morning. I haven't seen you in a while. Good to see you again. Nice to see you all. Uh, I've read a little bit up on this. The city, am I correct there? Yes. They have sold property to the rehack? Yeah. No, uh, they didn't. They actually. Um, conveyed the, the the southern part to the um, to their brothers and sisters and set, and dividing it up and retained an easement but down the, there. The biddies want biddy. I mean, they want access to get to the now. Reacts they're on the Gulf side. Am I correct there? Correct. Yes, correct. And the biddies are on the. Is it, it's okay. down. I, uh -huh. I know where it is. The Any pass side. there on the. Okay, all right, and they want to be where they can get to the water, Correct. right? And we determine here we're giving them e they want to retain egress and ingress where they can get to the water. That they don't want to be closed off because they've had it all the years. Correct. Am I halfway correct there? That's correct. All right, and Mr. Husband, the reacts and the biddies, everything's worked out and everything's going to be kosher here. Yes. And we're going to back off. So really, we're talking about 15 feet. Right. In reality, they can build up within five feet of the ten feet. And five feet yep. of the easement, exactly. Okay. All right, I'm Perfect. on board. Good yeah. deal. Pat, you said that, that they conveyed the property. It wasn't sold uh, from the biddies to the – was that in the family? Yes. Oh, okay. It's all family. It was all family to begin with, and then the, the, the family sold it to Dr. Rehab. Okay. The, okay. the, the brothers and sisters – um, the ones that gave the got the uh, the golf side sold it to Dr. Jack. <laughs> <laughs> so he's going to build a nice. He's going to build a nice house. Tax there. collecting home there. He's. And uh, they still want to be able to get to the water. I, I don't blame them. Jack's going to design okay. it like a palace in heaven. I'm hmm? sure. All right. All right. With only right. two stories. Just two stories. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's better. We get more tax money. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, any any other more questions for uh, for them, uh, gentlemen? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, I'll right, be back to Lee. I'll take it, Mr. Chairman. All right, go ahead, Mr. Snow. Right. Uh, in front of each of you uh, commissioners, if there's nothing else in terms of public comment, the applicant or the opposition, I'd like to refer you all to the uh, quasi judicial hearing or public hearing variance form that's been prepared for you by the planning department. Um, per your procedures, section 2.0507 is the variance and requirements and procedures. Um, as you heard earlier, the PDRB voted 3-0 to deny based on the uh, fact for further evidence and also the testimony they heard last week during their public hearing. Um, it sounds, as you have heard from both the applicant and the opposition, that I believe Mr. Uh, Floyd, on behalf of his clients, have uh, consented to this compromise, if you will. Uh, based on that, I must read to you section 34 and 35 of the LDR. I uh, each have the form in front of you, and I'll read through all four questions and ask you to either affirm or deny those. The special conditions and circumstances exist which are peculiar to the land, structure, or buildings involved, which are not applicable to other land, structures, or buildings in the same district. The literal interpretation of the provisions of this code would deprive the applicant of rights commonly enjoyed by other properties in the same district that the special conditions and circumstances do not result from the actions of the applicant, and that the grant and variance requested will not confer on the applicant any special privileges denied by these regulations to other land structures or buildings in the same district. I'd ask the Commission for a vote to either affirm one or all of those uh, individual requirements. Under your LDRs, it's an or, so you must establish at least one of those, and if you would, place a uh, vote on the record to establish that one of those uh, criteria have been met under a hardship relief. So out of these four, we need to decide on which one we're going to roll with. We're going to go with? Yes, sir. So I'd ask you, is there a special condition or circumstance that exists which are peculiar to the land structure or building? And if you feel as though there is, I'd ask you for a motion to affirm that. Gentlemen? I'll put the motion on the floor. I'll put it on. Second. All right, so we got a okay, okay. So hold on. So now we got to. So we got a motion by Commissioner McDaniel, but which you're saying that you're going yeah. number one. Yes, sir. So, and I and I would just take you step by step on the variance. Okay. 
there was two private landowners in 2015. Mr. Floyd represented some of them. Um, they had deed restrictions placed on them. They were properly recorded. You have that as part of your record last week and now. There was conveyances out to Dr. Rehack. It was a unique situation as you understand it, as I understand it. It's a staff's recommendation that there is a condition that exists between these two property owners, a gulf and a lagoon that gives it a special condition and circumstances that do exist that make it peculiar to this land between these two property owners, the family that conveyed it to Dr. Rehack and Dr. Rehack who now wants to do this. The two private property landowners have all come to a compromise as to they can accommodate the 10 foot ingress egress, add an additional five feet buffer, and Dr. Rehack can build within 15 feet of the property line. It's the staff's recommendation that there is the special condition and circumstances after you've heard from the record to affirm that. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Noah. So I got a, a motion by Commissioner McDaniel, second by Commissioner Rich. No, I second it. Commissioner McCrone. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, sir. All right. To uh, uh, that special conditions and circumstances do exist. Um, any uh, further board discussion on this? Anyone in the public on this? Any opposition to the motion? Motion passes 5 and 0. All right, the LDR requires you to establish one. That is one of the four, so there's no need to go to the other three unless the commission wishes to visit those. Okay. I'd ask the county commission accepts the planning department statement of completeness for the variance application. The Gulf County Commission deems the record submitted as competent and substantial evidence to support the decision of this commission for the variance and that the Gulf County Commission accepts um, the representations and the proper notice of the today's hearings uh, and provisions specified under special exceptions of the Gulf County LDRs for variance applications pursuant to a permanent public notice for quasi-judicial fix to the county courthouse and admin building policy effective November 19, 2014, which provides for public notice that all parties shall be permitted to present evidence. If you would uh, accept those representations so we can complete the record and you would have a finding of substantial and com competent evidence. Need a motion to accept yes, those sir. findings. So Got a motion by Commissioner McCrone. Second. Second by Commissioner Rich. Any uh, further board discussion? Anyone in the public accepting these findings? Any opposition to the motion? Motion passes 5 and 0. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And lastly, uh, based on the findings and your establishing the special exceptions, the following review and consideration of the variance application in this public hearing format versus the quasi-judicial and following the application of the above LDR guidelines to the submitted record deemed as substantial competent evidence by you today, this county commission hereby motions and votes the following, either to approve, deny, or table this variance of 15 feet, um, 15 foot variance. All right, how do you, um, how do you generate? Motion to uh, approve. All right, mo foot All right, motion by Commissioner Rogers to approve it. Second. Second by Commissioner McDaniels. Any further board discussion? Anyone in the public on approving this variance? Any opposition to the motion? Motion passes 5 and 0. Mr. Chairman, I just want to thank the property owners for working through the issue with the county this past week. We appreciate everyone's cooperation. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right, Mr. Collins. Collins, if you still have the floor. Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Uh, item number two is your non residential development. It's at uh, Summer Bay at the Cape LLC, parcel ID number 06276-024R, Track 24, Cape Sandblast, Gulfside and Bayside Subdivision. According to the plat thereof, recorded in plat book, page th uh, plat book 3, page 24, 24A, B, and 24C of the public records of Gulf County, Florida. The application is for a seven rental unit on the Bayside of Cape Sandblast off the Cape Sandblast Road South. All right, thank you, sir. Anyone who wishes to speak on this item, please step forward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sir. Um, I'm Jack Husband, here to represent uh, Summer Bay at the Cape, LLC. This is a Bayside parcel um, that w there was an existing residence on site, um, and the developer would like to add three additional structures which will be duplexes uh, to the site so for a total of seven units uh, on on the parcel again this hold is on a one second mr. parcel hold on one sec <laughs> oh that's my that's that's my fault oh, I'm sorry, sorry madam clerk all right anyone uh, uh, do, do do we have anyone that has any objection to the uh, waiving of the quasi-judicial hearing 
Anyone object to the waiving of the quasi-judicial hearing? If no objection, I need a motion to waive the quasi-judicial hearing. So moved. Second. Second. Got a motion by Commissioner McCrone, second by Commissioner Rich. Any further board discussion? Anyone in the public? All right. Five. Motion passed, five minutes to waive. I mean, Commissioner Rogers. Okay. <laughs> Commissioner Rogers, I'm sorry. <laughs> I might have said, Commissioner, oh. Commissioner Rogers, motion passes 5 0 to waive. Quasi judicial. 4 0, I'm sorry. 4 0 to waive. All right, Mr. Jack, you got the floor now. All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and just, just continuing on, uh, we this is a very low impact development. Um, we've provided ample parking. There is uh, additional four spaces at very minimum uh, that's being very conservative uh, for the parcel uh, working on stormwater now trying to get the the 10 2 permit going and all the proper permitting so that's uh that's that's where we're at okay what is uh we're going to do this recital we just want to put a couple things on the record because this is a this is a an exception to the to the density on the on the a side that this can't be split in the future and they understand yes, it. Yes, I'm, I'm sorry. Yes, yep. please. This, this cannot be um, due, due to the density there. Um, this is one owner, uh, Summer, Bay L Summer Bay at the Cape LLC. Um, therefore, it has been on record that the developer cannot come back and split these units um, for individual sale. So it will, if the sale transaction ever occurs which obviously it will at some point the entire development will have to be sold in in that manner what was the uh, recommendation of the pdrb pdrb recommended 3-0 vote to approve uh like mr husband said mr chairman this actually came before the board i think last november they had several questions and concerns all of those have been resolved uh the one owner was the big one uh, and they they all affirm free to approve okay okay um so yeah, mr chairman uh with no other comment or um, presentation the evidence in front of you you have the form mr chairman and commissioners um again it's for gulf county parcel 06276 024r um and i'll go through the requirements the commission shall review and consider the following requirements to affirm a motion by vote for the for this hearing the gulf county accepts the planning Department's statement of completeness for the non-residential development application. The Gulf County Commission deems the record submitted as competent and substantial evidence to support your decision. The Gulf County accepts the Planning Board Department's statement and representation that all proper notices for today's public hearing was, were provided in accordance with both the LDR and Florida statute. Um, and I'd ask you all, uh, commissioners, to consider that all collectively for an affirmative vote. All right. Appreciate it. Mr. Norton, I need a, I need a, a motion. Move. Motion Second. by Commissioner Rogers. Second by Commissioner McCrone. Uh, any further board, board discussion on this? Anyone in the public? Any opposition to the motion? Motion passes 5 and 0. Mr. Chairman, the second uh, segment of that is on page 2. It, it reads as follows. The Commission shall make a finding that the requirements regarding this non-residential development have been met by the applicant for the reasons set forth in the application and the record today. Uh, the Commission shall further make a finding the granting of the non-residential development will be in harmony with the general purpose and intent of these regulations and will be non-injurious to the neighborhood and otherwise detrimental to the public welfare. And under no circumstances shall this Commission grant a non-residential development to allow a use not permissible under the terms of these regulations in the district involved. And I'd ask you all to consider that for an affirmative vote. Thank you, sir. So moved. Motion by Commissioner Rogers. Second. Second by Commissioner McCrone. Any further board, dis board discussion? Anyone in the public? Any opposition to the motion? Motion passes 5 0. Mr. Chairman, lastly, at the bottom, it will have your action based on the findings you've established through your two affirmative votes. It reads as follows Following the review and consideration of non residential development in a quasi judicial public hearing format, and with the application of the above LDR guidelines to the submitted record deemed as substantial competent evidence, this county commission hereby motions and votes today to approve, deny, or table this application. And I'd offer that for your vote. Thanks, sir. So moved. Oh, we've got a motion to. Approve. Second. 
All right, got a second by Commissioner McDaniel. Any further uh, further board discussion? Anyone in the public? Any opposition to the motion? Motion passes 5 and 0. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Collinsworth. All right, we're moving on down. Item number seven, bid opening. <laughs> Ms. Roberts. Yes, sir. Chairman, thank you. We are here today, um, April 24th, 2018, to open bid number 171813 for the St. Joseph Peninsula Beach Renourishment Project. There were two bidders. First bid is Mason Construction. in construction. I apologize. Their bid, pro, uh, bid amount is $705,882.35 cubic yards. Say that again, Lynn. Wait a minute. Second bidder is Great Lakes Dredge and Dock Company. Enclosed is one original and five copies. Before she gives that, for the record on the first bid, um, there was only one original, no copies were provided. The sand volume on the second bidder, Great Lakes Dredge and Dock, 340,000. Hi, Mr. Ham. Chairman, uh, we want our coastal engineer to come up. I, I would recommend tabling uh, staff to come back with a recommendation lower than what I had in, in mind. It's it's only roughly two thirds of what our original design was, but I'll let Mike discuss. Uh, yes, the uh, thank you, uh, Mike Dombrowski with MRD Associates. The volume, keep in mind, is that we're only going from the southern end is not including the northern end that we deleted. So we had in the original design, it was roughly about 800,000 cubic yards in the southern end. And so this is seven 
a uh, little bit over 700,000. It's about what we had in our range between 700 and about 850,000 that we were looking at. So, Michael, does this not include the million dollars we got from the state? Um, Yeah, ten point two, Mr. Hammond. Uh, we'll meet with him. Excuse me. We'll we'll meet with our engineer and and uh, probably have a special meeting next week if that's good with the board. Uh, the the main thing we have we have a couple things. One, we need Mike's recommendation. Number two, because the restore money is so critical about when we can award and, and certainly with a notice of award, we want to make sure that we run this through our consultant before we we actually make an award. So we, we will do the, the, the background work and come back to you next week with a recommendation if that's good. So I need a motion to table. So I move. Second. Motion by Commissioner McCrone to table this. Second by Commissioner Rogers. Any further uh, board discussion? Anyone in the public on this? Excuse come on up, Dr. Hartman. Oh. <laughs> Pat Hartman. President Coastal Community Association. Um, I'm, I'm disappointed in the low cubic yardage. Uh, we've got to get some sand out there. The bid, when I went to the bid conference, was put out at 10.2 million. Uh, we, when we closed this down in October, the amount that we had put out there left to do this project was 10.8 understanding that some of it still had to be used for engineering and what have you. In March, I ask you when you put this bid back out to leave the door open to add that more money if it happened to come in. After, after the fact, we got another million dollars from Halsey Bashir's and uh, Senator Montford's efforts, and it's going through the Department of Agriculture to get to us. I would like to make sure that we have that additional a million dollars over and above what we had left in the 10.2 or 10.6 that w was quoted in October. And, uh, you know, it's a matter of accounting. It is what it is. But I uh, would hate to tell Halsey that I, we went out and did all this and got a million dollars and it just disappeared somewhere. Is a 10-2 not, well, is, a, is a million included in the 10-2? Yes, but 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 at the, at the end of the day, the, the there were a lot of constraints that were put on us by the the vote of the board when we did the bond. The, you know, everybody was told the the Cape's putting up four million, the county's putting up four million, the state's putting up four million. The Cape didn't put up four million because the Cape's bond was limited to the total payback of four million over the ten years, so we had to back out the interest for the four years. So the Cape's portion wound up being three point two and some change. Three two. The the. Okay which lowered the amount, which also lowers by 35 or 36 percent what the state puts in based on that number. The other thing is we intended this project to be done nine months ago. We've had to carry interest costs that we had intended on the original deal to pay that $2.8 million back from Restore over a year ago. So we've had an, an extra year of interest cost. We have left ourselves a cushion of about $400,000. We have included that million, but, okay. but the truth be known, we did not have in real terms because we're a year and a half behind or a year plus behind, depending on when we actually award, we did not have that amount that was quoted last October that because we have another year of carrying cost and okay. interest on $4 million, even at 4% is a pretty good little chunk. So we had some design changes, we had some other expenses, but the, the million, whatever is left, will be applied. We'll, we'll change order more sand if we have any more money, but Sherry thinks those numbers are pretty pretty good. So we're but at 10-2. We, we, we bid, Mike. yeah, we bid, I, I think that's correct, Mike. We bid 10-2? Yeah. 10-2. Okay. 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 I'm going to go get a bucket of sand and start toting. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we are, and, and again, we're not trying to delay. I would love to award today. I, I need to make yeah. absolutely certain that we follow the proper procedure. Uh, Warren had to go out of town, but, but we need to make sure that we follow the proper procedures for that $2.8 million reimbursement from Treasury, which is a boondoggle, and we want to make sure that we're good with our million, which we're very proud of, our legislative and, and our lobbyists for, for, for helping with that. But 
uh, bef before we move forward. But we're not trying to delay. I know that I know Butch and, and everybody's ready to start pumping. We want to move as quickly as possible, but we, we don't want to foul that up in any way. Understand entirely. Uh, the pumping is important as soon as we can start. Um, if if whenever you come back, um, the the seven hundred. Some seven hundred plus cubic yards. I, I think the people out there would like to know how far is that going to take us. Uh, we were we were shooting to try to get at least to the the, the um, Rich Park, and will that get us to Rich Park, or where will it get us down, down the line? And I know that can't be, be said question. today. Uh, <laughs> but Pat, when you come when you come back, how far we're we going out? Right, well, how far? We can go out for like ten feet. We can go to Bay County, but we got to <laughs> go out three or four hundred feet. Yeah, got to. Going too far. Got to. But that's if that. I think that would. When you come back, I would really appreciate knowing how far that's going to go as well. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yes, I, the work that staff's done on this is phenomenal. Thank you. I, I have to I have to give you a hundred percent on it. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Any anyone else in the public on this? Anyone else? Is there any opposition to the motion table? Motion passes five and on the table. Butch, don't give up. <laughs> you and I being on old folks home ramping our wheelchairs together. Well, we getting your sand, it looks like. You're all working hard. I know it, I know it, I know it. Bureaucracy. All right, number, uh, we'll move on down to number eight. Well, not number eight. I need to add somebody in here. I want to add uh, Ms. Sarah Hines from the Florida Department of Health. You come on up, please. Wow. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, Good morning. How you doing? Who's these ladies? <laughs> My name is Sarah Hines. I'm the assistant director for the Florida Department of Health in Gulf and Franklin counties. I have Stephanie Cash. She's our healthy families coordinator, and Antoinette Batson. She's our family support worker, but I like to call her our parenting coach. Okay, um, before we get started, Mr. McCrone, I just want to thank you for recognizing the sixth grade SWAT student. I can't wait to tell them. They, they get so excited about um, speaking to the county commissioners. They, they love to educate their peers about the dangers of tobacco, but I'm, I got to tell you their favorite audience is definitely the county commissioners. So thank you for that. Oh, I was impressed she took the time to, yeah. to do that. And, uh, great. Absolutely. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for recognizing her. Um, I'm holding a pinwheel up because we're here to celebrate um, Prevent Child Abuse Month and the Pinwheels for Prevention campaign. And the blue pinwheel um, is the national symbol for prevent child abuse. And there are a lot of campaigns that we celebrate in public health. This is one of my favorites. Um, the Pinwheels for Prevention campaign has been used a lot in our local media outlets. So Tim Croft at the Star, thank you so much for promoting this. Um, we've had advertisements there. Um, we've had billboards. You'll see them in the Weewa area. And we've had radio advertisements. And um, they all share the same message, and that's that great childhoods matter because every child deserves to grow up feeling safe and loved. And that's what this is all about. Um, in public health, we're committed to connecting families to resources that create those safe and nurturing environments. And we know in public health, the first five years of a child's life really help to shape that foundation um, for their development and their future health. And so um, we want all children to grow up feeling happy and healthy. And in Gulf County, we are committed to connecting families to those resources that they may need. And here to speak on the program, um, on a program that we operate that promotes great childhoods is members of our Healthy Families team. Good morning, Commissioners. Thank morning. you. Um, so what is Healthy Families? Healthy Families is a nationally accredited family support and coaching program that helps parents provide the safe, stable, and nurturing homes that children need for healthy growth, growth and development. Our services are voluntary and provided in the families' homes throughout Gulf County. Services are customized to enhance parenting skills, reduce stress, provide education on home safety and childproofing, and increase children's literacy. Our highly trained home visitors, such as Ms. Batson here with me, um, promote positive parent-child interactions, support healthy child development, 
enhance family functioning, relationships, and problem-solving skills, and link families to health and support services in the community through referrals. Um, I am the family support worker and I'm actually in the homes and some of the things we do in the homes is like Stephanie said we do parent education for home safety we also help parents learn healthy, healthy ways to deal with everyday stress that everybody has we also help our parents to obtain um, immunization and well checks so they're on time so they're not behind we also do family goal planning to look forward to the future set goals with the families. Um, we link them with community services that are available to the families. We do a lot in the homes and I really enjoy what I do. I really enjoy watching the children grow up and just seeing the families go from one level to the next. Right. So thank you, that's certainly all we had to say. I mean, there's a lot of different programs that we operate in public health. This is just another side of what we do, and we're really proud of the people that we serve. So. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, guys, you. for all you do. I got one question uh, I'd ask, if y'all don't mind. Sure, sure. Did y'all work with the commissioners? Yes. Because we need help with stress <laughs> issues also. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Just give us no. a call. In, <laughs> your, in your little bags that we brought today yeah. are some yeah. helpful information. Yes. <laughs> okay. We, we, we're definitely going to read it. Thank you, guys. Uh, thank you. We appreciate it. Uh, Ms. Ms. Novak, before I go to the public, um, I don't know if you want to kind of mention about the uh, that beach, that new beach law. Certainly. Say anything about that? I'd be happy to, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. Um, House Bill 631 was passed. It was uh, um, legislation uh, Governor Scott had pushed. It was with regards to beach restrictions. Um, and I've discussed it with each of the commissioners and staff. I know that some of you commissioners have received a lot of calls with regards to that since it's passed. It goes into effect this summer. Um, just for the commission and for the public, um, we've monitored it, we've read through it, we've analyzed it, but the crux of the uh, law that will be put into effect is going forward, what they did is they nullified Walton County's uh, customary use ordinance. Um, uh, 2000, last year, Walton County passed an ordinance where it uh, adopted the customary use doctrine, which is uh, historically in Florida for over 100 years, the historical and ancient use of our sandy shores throughout belongs to everybody in the state of Florida all people. Um, there's obviously been wrangling and issues with regards to private property rights over the years going back to 1975 there was a, a Supreme Court case with Daytona Beach um, but the court has historically found that these shores belong to everyone in Florida. Uh, the law that's been passed now will impose upon cities or counties going forward that if we want to adopt a customary use ordinance that we need to go through the courts to justify it. it's a long process you need to establish provide evidence to the court and the court needs to justify it. Um, Volusia County, St. John's County have done that. They've gone through the court system and so those have been upheld, those types of customary use ordinances. Uh, Gulf County doesn't have a customary use ordinance but we are under the same state doctrine as everybody else in all 67 counties that are the ones that line the coast. Um, but I do want to speak to a couple of the issues. Gulf County is un unique in that we do have also historical ordinances that we've adopted. We've had beach driving I believe for about 80 years in Gulf County and ordinances that go back for decades. We've had a leave no trace ordinance that you've all adopted. Um, most importantly also 10 years ago when we went through this restoration project for our beaches we also adopted a, an erosion control line. Um, you'll see in the law and on all the case history and uh, the language it talks about the mean high water line. So everyone in Florida can walk out to the, enjoy the mean high water line. The high tide into the towards the water uh, folks throughout Florida can enjoy that. We have an erosion control line here in Florida in Gulf County so we could do this restoration project. We're all defined by that. Um, so we'll continue to drive on our beaches, enforce our ordinances, our leave no trace. Um, our ordinances that we've adopted historically are sensitive and appreciate private property rights. Uh, most notably we've talked about leave no trace where we've acknowledged and found a balance with private property owners. Um, when this law comes into effect this summer, Gulf County is going to continue and I've had discussions with the commissioners, we'll continue to enforce our local ordinances. Um, if the county ever gets to the point in the future where it wishes to consider a customary use ordinance, it is a, um, an expensive and drawn out process, but it's one that if the county directs us to do so in the future, we would do it, but the law will require us to go through the court system. Um, and like I said, folks have come up and asked me about it, uh, some of your constituents in each of your districts, and I'll be happy to continue to discuss it with any folks that have questions as we move forward. Okay, thank you. Any any board members want to anything on that? 
Okay. All right. We move down to last item, public public discussion. Is anyone in the public come before the board? Anyone in the public? Come on up, sir. State your name and record for the address for the record, please, Mr. Rowland. I'm Roland Wilson, 7151 Cape Sandblast Road. For the most part, the boards in the past and the current board has done a reasonably good job of overseeing the county business. But therein lies the trick word, oversee. You were hired by an electoral process through each district to be the overseers for the county population voters. For the most part, I think you have done that. On occasion, I have felt that you board members past and present, think you are the boss. And by that I mean we have kicked county-wide voting down the road for Lord knows how many years. I think by now you should have run out of excuses why it can't be done. We, and I speak solely for myself, and I'm sure the rest of the voters in this county encourage this board to get started on that process. There is no longer an, a valid excuse. Secondly, why does the meetings have to be in the mornings? Used to be they were in the evenings. The working people could attend. Now you have excluded them and possibly that is by your choice. I've heard it said that is to save money from the county, for the county by not having to pay overtime to county employees. Why can they not come in late or leave early to compensate for the time that it would take to have a meeting in the evening? start at 6 Eastern time. This is one of the two counties that I understand in the entire United States that has a split time zone in the county. And that upsets meetings. Now, that is the main reason I came to this meeting sat through all that you presented and had others present, learned a lot. But remember, you are hired to represent the people, to do the will of the majority of the people, not Hold on one second, Mr. Rogan. to do what you want. Hold on one second. Hold on. No, I'm you, done. You, That's you sure? it. You sure? That's okay. all I really wanted to say. Thank you, Mr. Rowland. Okay. Thanks, sir. Anyone else in the public? Anyone else in the public? Anyone else? Well, we want to take this time to thank everyone for coming out to the uh, April 24th Board of County Commissioners meeting. And uh, everyone have a blessed day. I need a motion to adjourn. Got a motion thank by you. Commissioner McCrone, second.